convenience store coffee and a cool science shirt. And we're ready to go with enzymes today. So let's do it. Hi everyone, my name is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy and it's good to have you guys back. It's been some time since we released the last video. Sorry, things have been a little bit crazy here, but we're back today to finish up chapter eight, which is going to be about enzymes. And I know that this kind of seems to come out of the blue because majority of chapter eight has been about energetics and the exchange of energy in different types of chemical reactions. But there is a linkage there that we're going to create with enzymes. And once we get that established, then we can talk about the current model of enzymatic activity that we call the induced fit model. Model. And then we'll talk about factors that affect enzymatic activity, including things like inhibitors and regulation models. And as always, click like and subscribe and leave a comment below if you have any questions and we'll try to get back to you. We answer 100% of the comments that we get, probably because we don't get that many comments. But it's great to engage with you guys. So let's get started with the energy stuff first. A review of chapter eight could be found right here in the link below. But just to give you guys a quick recap, we talked about different types of chemical reactions. We had catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions, both of which had some exchange of energy that was happening. In the case of catabolic reactions, these were exergonic reactions, which released energy from the molecule to the environment as a result of the fact that this was favored by the universe as a spontaneous reaction that increased entropy. On the other hand, we had anabolic reactions that required energy or consumed energy as an endergonic reaction, which was then non-spontaneous as it decreased the entropy of the system. However, whether it's a catabolic or an anabolic reaction, we didn't really talk about something called the activation energy. Energy. So for instance, in catabolic reactions where we'd expect things to be spontaneous, things are not as spontaneous as they may seem. So for instance, if you have a little lighter, it's not going to instantaneously combust into flames unless you give it a little spark. And just like that, this activation energy will inhibit even spontaneous reactions that release energy from spontaneously happening. And this would be doubly true for anabolic reactions because it's already unlikely to happen. So where enzymes come into play is by reducing the activation energy required for both catabolic and anabolic reactions to occur. So taking a look at this diagram of a catabolic reaction, you'll see that the free energy of the reactants is definitely greater than the products. So it should be as simple as a ball rolling down a hill. However, that hump that you have there called the activation energy inhibits this reaction from moving forward. And in the second diagram, you'll see that this activation energy has been reduced as a result of enzyme presence. Now in the model of the anabolic reaction, similar things would occur. What enzymes do is by reducing the activation energy, it makes reactions much more likely to occur and even takes reactions that would otherwise be impossible happen. So how do the enzymes accomplish this feat? Well, in chemistry and physics, we might be tempted to actually quantify the reduction in activation energy by counting the joules or calories that are now reduced as a result of the presence of enzymes. But in AP biology, we don't really need to worry about the quantification of the activation energy. What we do need to know are some of the mechanical ideas behind how enzymes can reduce the activation energy. So these enzymes can do things such as orienting the substrates properly so that they lock into place so that the reaction is much more likely to occur. They might actually bend the substrate to strain the bonds so that the hydrolysis reaction is much more likely to occur. They could even temporarily bond to the substrate or otherwise simply creating a favorable micro environment in which these chemical reactions can take place. So as you can see, we just need to know physically and mechanically how the enzymes are doing what they're doing. Now that leads us nicely into the second part of this video, which is about the induced fit model. Now in ninth grade, you may have learned about something called the lock and key model and lock and key model makes a lot of sense. You have the substrate, which is structured like the active site of an enzyme so that they bond properly. And then you have all of this magic. However, for AP biology, we need to understand that there is a little bit of sophistication added to the lock and key model with our current understanding of how enzymes work. And this is called the induced fit model. The induced fit model states that when the substrates bind to the enzymes, it's not just that the enzymes are affecting the structure of the substrate, the substrate itself also affects the structure of the enzyme. And this actually makes sense because if you think about what enzymes are, they're proteins and proteins have conformations or structures that arise from the chemical interactions of our groups of amino acids that make up the protein. However, when you have another chemical like a substrate that bind to the active site, the interaction between the substrate and the R groups that are exposed at the active site will result in additional chemical changes that could have wide effects 
across the entirety of the enzyme. So in many examples, what we see is that when the substrates bind to the enzyme, the enzyme itself will also shift its structure, therefore leading to all of the different mechanisms that we talked about earlier, like straining the bonds or creating a favorable micro environment. And that is generally how we understand how enzymes operate. Now, the last part of this video is going to focus on factors that affect enzyme functions. And this is actually going to be a bit of review of unit one, because in unit one, we learned about proteins. And one of the quintessential examples of proteins were enzymes. And as a result, we've already talked about denaturation and renaturation of enzymes. But here we're going to mention this one more time. Enzyme functions are affected by many different factors, environmental factors, including things like temperature, pH, as well as salinity can affect enzyme function as a result of its effect on enzyme structure. So just as a quick review, remember that all enzymes are proteins held together by chemical interactions of the R groups. When temperature increases, the vibrational energy or the kinetic energy of each atom that's part of that enzyme will start to become greater. And as a result, weak bonds like hydrogen bonding or van der Waals forces or even ionic and covalent bonding at sufficient temperatures will become compromised. And as a result, the structure of the enzyme will fall apart becoming denatured. Now, because structure and function are so intricately tied in biology, what we see is that the lack of structure will result in the lack of function. And generally, what we see is a bell shaped curve for how temperature affects enzymatic activity. And the reason for this is that if it's too hot, we've just mentioned denaturation, but if it's too cold, then of course, you're not going to have enough kinetic energy in order for molecules to interact with one another. And as a result, you'll see a bell shaped curve in terms of enzymatic activity. This is also true for pH. Recall that pH is the relative concentration difference of hydroniums and hydroxides. Both of these are ions. And as a result, electromagnetic interactions, including hydrogen bonds and ionic bonds can become compromised too. And the same thing would apply for salinity because things like sodium chloride dissociate into sodium ions and chloride ions in solutions, which are both charged and again, can compromise electromagnetic interactions between the R groups, as well as things like hydrogen bonding in even the secondary structure. Now, the most exciting part of chapter eight is the discussion on inhibitors. And that's what I want to talk about now. You see, enzyme inhibitors are molecules that can inhibit the functions of enzymes. So you might be thinking, why would any organism want to produce inhibitors for their enzymes? Well, the truth is that inhibitors tend to be things like toxins and poisons, which are actually adapted to influencing enzymes of other species like predators or herbivores. So in this case, we're looking at how enzymes can be inhibited by the presence of these molecular inhibitors. However, we do need to categorize inhibitors into two distinct categories. We have on one hand, competitive inhibitors and the other non-competitive inhibitors. So let's talk about competitive inhibitors first. Competitive inhibitors are shaped sort of like the substrate that was originally intended for the enzyme, or at least part of the substrate. And these inhibitors will occupy the active site of the enzyme without actually resulting in the reactants that needs to be produced. And as a result, they will compete against the substrate, therefore occupying the enzymes without any effective reactions that are taking place. Now, non-competitive inhibitors work very differently. Non-competitive inhibitors do not look anything like the substrate However, they do have a shape that does bind to what we call an allosteric site on the enzyme. Now, an allosteric site is a site that's away from the active site, but once bound to a substance like a non-competitive inhibitor can actually have chemical interactions that results in a conformational change or a structural change that will shut down the active site. So it's almost like a switch being turned off so that the enzyme stops working. And the names actually make sense. These non-competitive inhibitors are not actually competing for the active site of the enzyme, but rather affecting a different site that will ultimately have an effect on the way that the reaction rate occurs. Now, all of this seemed pretty easy, but what's really important is how we apply this to what we call the enzyme kinetics graph. Now, michaelis menten graphs are important in biology because it tells us how enzyme rates can be influenced as a function of substrate concentrations. And in normal michaelis menten graphs, what we see is that as a substrate concentration increases, enzyme rate increases as well. However, it does plateau at what we call a Vmax, an asymptote, at which point all the enzyme 
atoms are saturated and the reaction rate cannot increase any further. However, we can also analyze what might happen to a normal mycalis menten graph when we have the presence of competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. In this diagram, we actually have two additional lines that show the presence of competitive and non-competitive inhibition and how it affects enzyme kinetics. Now, can you take a guess as to which one represents the competitive and which one represents the non-competitive inhibitors? A is competitive inhibition. And the reason for this is that competitive inhibitors compete against the substrate for the active site. As you increase the substrate concentration to sufficient degrees, you'll actually be able to outcompete the competitive inhibitors and eventually bring the reaction rate to what it was supposed to be at Vmax without the inhibitor. However, B is non-competitive inhibition. And the reason for this is that despite how many substrates you have in that solution, if the active site is shut down as a result of non-competitive inhibitors bound to the allosteric site, it doesn't matter. It would not help you by increasing the substrate concentrations. So knowing how to read these graphs is going to be very important for your success in AP Biology. The last part of this video is going to be about negative feedback inhibition using a specific example from Campbell Biology, which involves the conversion of threonine into isoleucine, both of which are amino acids. Now, this is really cool because we just talked about allosteric sites before when talking about non-competitive inhibition. So now incorporating that idea, we can now talk about how active sites of certain enzymes can be modulated by the use of negative feedback inhibition. So let's take a look at this example. Threonine is an amino acid, so is isoleucine. Depending on how much of each you have, the cell may want to convert some threonine into isoleucine through a series of enzymatic reactions that are part of this metabolic pathway. However, what's really important to note is that if this reaction is happening constantly, then you'll run out of threonine and all you have is isoleucine, and that may not be what the cell wants. And as a result, cells have evolved a pathway through which the final product, isoleucine, can have an impact on the progression of this pathway. So let's take a look. Here we have threonine, which undergoes the initial chemical reaction with the enzyme threonine deaminase, which presumably removes the amine group from threonine. However, through a series of reactions, it becomes isoleucine. Now, threonine deaminase is interesting because it has an allosteric site which can bind to isoleucine. So as this reaction happens and isoleucine builds up, isoleucine will bind to the allosteric site, thereby shutting down threonine deaminase's active site, shutting down this entire pathway. Now, why is this important? Well, because you don't want too many isoleucine. So a lot of isoleucine will result in the slowing down of this reaction. Now, how do you get it to go again? Well, the isoleucine that's bound to threonine deaminase will eventually be used up by the cell as the isoleucine demand increases. And as a result, the threonine deaminase enzyme will open its active site back up, converting threonine into isoleucine once again when isoleucine levels are low. So that about sums up the essence of enzymes that you need to know for this chapter. And I know that we went through it pretty quickly, but we're gonna be talking about enzymes over and over and over again. So we'll be reviewing these same concepts constantly throughout the year. So I hope to see you guys in the next next video. This has been Mikey with Avo Prep Academy. See you in the next one.